So as designers, as product managers, I'm sure we can all think of somewhere we've worked that has a really grand and ambitious vision. But when it comes to realizing this vision, well, all too often, we fail. We fall short. And one of the reasons that this can happen is when a design culture isn't set up to support innovation. So when a design culture doesn't support innovation, we find ourselves with diverse and disjointed teams, separate teams responsible for different slices of a product with no coherence. We find that we don't have the time or the space to do meaningful discovery work. We find that we're lacking the ability to design and implement at scale. And when requirements change, we are operationally inflexible. We are unable to adapt or pivot. We find that we waste effort and we duplicate work. And we, the problem is we understand what we are designing and we understand very intimately the users and the use cases that we are designing for, but we're failing to apply that same scrutiny to the how, to the means by which we deliver. But here's the truth. You can't innovate on products without first innovating on the way that you build them. To realize innovation, we cannot solely focus on the product and its users. We need that innovative design culture. We need a culture that continually manages to foster creativity, but also has the structure to design and implement at scale. And what I'm here to talk to you about today is how design ops can support that underlying structure that we need to support innovation. So we're going to have a look at what we mean by design ops, how design ops can support innovation, and an example of design ops in practice at a fintech client. So what is design ops? Well, design ops looks at the operational activities that support design. It's focusing on those underlying practices, processes and tools that we need to make a design workflow more efficient and robust. It's about enabling designers to work more effectively so that product delivery is more efficient and so that design can work at scale as your product or your organization grows. It enables our products to be more consistent and avoids us having to solve those same problems again and again. And probably even more important than efficiency is that that design ops has that solid practices that allows us to adapt and flex. So I'm guessing that pretty much everyone here knows what a design system is. And it's where many companies are starting. When they're looking at investing in design and thinking about design at scale, they start looking at adopting or building out a design system. But where they're often falling short is by not recognizing that a design system is a product in itself. It will evolve, it requires maintenance, governance, roadmap, and ownership. And having a design system is a cornerstone of design ops, but it's only part of the puzzle. So design ops is much broader than just setting up a design system. So if it's more than a design system, then what is it? Well, there are different views and organizations are handling design ops in different ways <clears throat> to suit their businesses. As an example, Airbnb have an entire design ops team that focuses on localization because for Airbnb, ensuring that their language and their products are international is such a crucial part of their product offering. But we find at Norman & Sons that these four areas are probably the most important for the banks and the fintechs that we work with. So take a look. Process and governance. So this area addresses questions like, how do we make sure that every step of the design workflow is efficient? And how do we, take the, how do we reduce that time it takes to go from an idea to delivery? And how can we withstand those changing requirements and not get crippled by them. So what does that look like in practice? Well, it's things like creating decision trees and having set processes. Now, a really great but very simple example here 
is having a decision tree that helps you decide whether something is a bug or a defect or an enhancement. You know, these things, they remove bias and personal opinion from the conversation and become that single source of truth that everyone can refer to. They reduce those inefficiencies not just for designers, but for QA and development and their overall product delivery cycle. But in this area, it's also having processes that are resilient, that can allow people to change their mind, so that when your branding changes, that doesn't create a huge panic or a, you know, an overflowing backlog. There's that process to manage it, and there's a way to fold those changes in. Tools. So how can we equip the team with the right tools that they need to create that really high quality work? And how can the tools that we use day to day in our workflow make our products more consistent? So in practice, this is having a thoughtful choice of tools. Um, software and applications that are chosen because they're empowering your design teams, not because they're cheap or they're the latest buzz or because the design director loves them. You know, tools that are integrating really well with each other and they're crossing those disciplines between design and development. It's also where your design system comes in, but that's a tool, you know, it's a product that is serving your teams. It needs version controlling and processes around its use. And getting tools right becomes even more critical when we have um, remote teams and distributed teams. So design thinking teaches us that value of having feedback early and often, while design ops addresses that how. How can we have better feedback, communication, and documentation without creating extra work? It enables our teams to learn and improve as we go. And this is especially relevant as a team grows, because the bigger an organization is, despite everyone's best intentions, it gets really hard to communicate design. Your standards get diluted, teams become disjointed, and design starts to happen in silos. So some of the ways to get around this are ensuring that there's regular design reviews, critiques and workshops where people are getting together to work and figure out the best way to solve something. And I was recently speaking at a design ops event with Centrica, uh, Centrica are British Gas, and they've uh, focused on design ops because they've gone through rapid growth. You know, their design system is now three times larger than it was a couple of months ago. And one of the things that they're having to do is improve communication. So they're having weekly open critique sessions. But they've also had to focus on improving the openness and the transparency, you know, that sense of support so that the feedback is really valuable. The other side to this pillar is uh, integrating a way to regularly collect user and customer feedback and making sure that your design team are able to understand and respond and finally, at the heart of this is people. How can we make sure that our teams have the right skills and the training? And how can we make sure that the right kind of people are right, working on the right kind of things? And how can we keep our designers motivated and happy? So in practice, it's working with product owners to understand the skill sets that we need for the type of work we're doing and establishing what skills or gaps we have in the team. It's improving our onboarding experience I'm sure many of us can recognize the pain of starting a new role and spending that first week having to request software, file access, wondering where the latest style guide is. Well, Atlassian is one of the fastest growing software companies in the world, and they have around 250 people in their design team, which is always evolving. And when they take on a new designer, the week before they start, they send them a book all about designing at Atlassian so that they feel that they have that understanding of the culture before they join. They also get you know, useful things like where to park in the car park, what to do on your first day, a whole load of resources, an org chart, and it really accelerates that onboarding experience and improves happiness. And finally, the fourth pillar is about that sense of community and inspiration. So it's taking time to celebrate the expertise you have in the team and bringing in different perspectives, external speakers and events like this. So we find that focusing on these four areas of design ops really creates that foundation of a design culture. 
And what we tend to find is that the first two, processes and tools, they already have some attention. So a lot of organisations are recognising that you need UX governance and they're recognising the value of a design system. But they're often lacking that organisational support to really make it a success. And the last two, collaboration and people, they're typically lagging, particularly in organisations that are really rapidly growing their design functions and delivering at pace. So let's take a look at design ops and innovation. So how can design ops support organisations with their innovation? Well, a foundation of design ops is robust. It means we have that framework to adapt and we are prepared for change. Whether that change is new brand or the design headcount doubling, as the situation we heard with Monzo earlier. And design ops is key to scaling design in, in line with organisational growth. Because as we innovate and as we expand product lines and functionality, there's an acute need for design standardization and for better communication. And scaling with design ops means that we scale with stability, which is of critical importance in FS and FinTech. But design ops is not just relevant to production work when we're building things. It brings that structure and governance to discovery. So we know that discovery and innovation thrive when there is an experimental environment, when failing is okay. But without structure and discipline, experimentation is costly and unable to be implemented at scale. Well, design ops means that discovery takes place on top of a really steady framework. So your concepts can get spun up quickly and can get tested and validated early on. And we can start to focus on the uncertainties because that framework already has the basics covered. And as reuse is encouraged, we can contribute back. We're not doing throwaway work. You know, our experimentation has cost us less. And even if we do fail, we're failing productively. We're actually yielding even more useful information to build on. It's a myth that innovation is light bulb moments from individuals. You know, innovative ideas are actually slow burning. And this is a title of an article from the Wall Street Journal, which says that most innovations are created through networks, they're groups of people working in concert. Well, design ops helps with fostering that collaborative culture. It ensures that the opportunities to create and collaborate are that regular heartbeat in the process. And we can generate and expand on ideas and get unstuck and el eliminate those bad ideas quickly. Collaboration means that we avoid silos where different teams are responsible for those different slices of products. And this situation described by Atlassian is so common that it's actually known as Conway's Law, where the product is ending up reflecting the organisation that has built it. And if the organisation doesn't collaborate, then that shows as a disjointed user experience. Well, changing the organisational structure isn't always the answer. At HubSpot, who build marketing and sales software, they didn't change their structure, and they kept multiple product teams, m more than 40 product teams. And well, they found that you know, having a really extensive design system has helped to solve some of the inconsistencies that they struggled with. Um, you know, before developing their design system, I think they had 100 shades of gray, six primary buttons, you know, very classic examples, actually. But the key word in this quote is unknowingly. They just didn't know. They weren't communing or collaborating. And that really is that key to avoiding the fragmented user experience. So we've talked a bit about a design system, but what about other tools? Why do tools matter when we talk about innovation? So we've worked with a client that had a really large and established design team with a web and mobile product that was used by thousands. But the products were inconsistent. The terminology was different, the, the navigation, the information architecture, very inconsistent across the web and the mobile offering. And it was taking a really long time to build. And while they were innovating with new features, these improvements were taking a really long time to actually get realized into the product. 
Well, we find when we work with them that this team, we're actually using more than 20 different design tool tools amongst them. So they were struggling to collaborate. With, there were no centralized resources, no templates that could be re reused. Designers started from scratch in whichever tool they felt most comfortable and most familiar with. And the inconsistencies in their designs were actually showing in the inconsistencies in their end products. The onboarding was difficult, and there was that real lack of knowledge sharing, of collaboration. But it, on the other hand, there were lots of isolated experts in their own tool. So all of this was really stifling their creativity and just wasting time. So design ops can sound very constraining and restrictive. And I'm aware that it does sound quite contradictory to talk about standardization and process and governance in design, where we're also talking about divergent thinking and ideation and design sprints. But truly, design ops is not a barrier to creativity. It makes space for creative thinking. By putting that dedicated time, resources, and attention to the operational aspect, we stop spending our days pixel pushing, redoing specs, or tweaking custom CSS. And this quote by Adrian Orner at LinkedIn actually underplays the problem, I feel. You know, it's more than a problem. If, we, if, as designers, we are so bogged down with operational stuff that we're only spending 50% of our time actually managing to do what we were hired to do. So design ops can help give us back time, but it also makes sure that the time we have is spent on the right problems, the really valuable problems, the challenges that are unique to our products. We're no longer spending that time trying to decide what a button should look like or which is the current shade of blue, or where we locate the latest prototype. We have that time back for creative problem solving, to solve those really interesting and valuable problems, the challenges that are unique, because it's those challenges that actually provide the opportunities for being creative, for innovating on how we meet user and customer needs. So I'm going to end with an example of how we've used design ops to help a fintech client of Norman & Sons. So Cloud Margin is the world's first and only cloud-based collateral management product. Um, their product centralizes collateral agreements and data and automates a lot of processes. And when we first worked with them, their product was mostly used by medium-sized asset managers but they had a very ambitious vision. They wanted to be used by the big, big meeting institutions, the likes of HSBC, UBS, etc. So they wanted to overhaul the UI and the UX of their product to help them achieve that goal. And they needed that innovative design vision for their current product. So we helped them articulate their vision um, did the research and design and worked very closely with them to create an Envision prototype that they could immediately begin to use as a sales tool with prospective customers. You know, it sets the direction of delivery and also motivates their internal teams. But when we worked with them, we found that in order to have that success with that vision, to actually really deliver that, they needed to foster that innovative design culture. As an example, previously for every customer, they were creating a bespoke version of their platform that addressed the individual needs and requirements for that customer. So it's designing, building, maintaining multiple versions of a product. It takes a very long time to, to realize, and it's also not sustainable. Not scalable when we think about what their vision is, you know, and with larger banks comes increasingly complex requirements. It also meant that their design and their innovation was happening in silos on these bespoke versions and they were solving the same problems again and again but not contributing back to the core product. So to ensure that they could realize their vision, we addressed that how, how to deliver that vision, the design practices that were need to, needed to deliver. And we help Cloud Margin embed that foundation of design ops to deliver that value. So some of the things we did, looking across those four pillars of design ops, well, with process and governance, we, we changed the approach to design. 
Um, it might sound fairly obvious to a lot of people in the room, but actually we started to work with them in iterations, research, design and test and roll out incrementally, iteratively across the product. We instilled design QA and created testing guides for non-designers so that it doesn't have to be designers performing design QA. Um, we help them with a tool set, so we set up sketch and vision and abstract to help them design, improve that um, delivery process across their design and development teams. We help Cloud Margin hire designers who have that pragmatism to maintain and grow a design ops approach to product delivery. So what Cloud Margin has now, they not only have that vision of their new product experience, but they also have the means to realise that vision. They have that robust design and delivery process so they can avoid the situations that we mentioned at the start of this talk. DesignOps has enabled Cloud Margin to grow their product in line with their business and has enabled them to innovate. Innovate on their product, but they have that structure to design and implement those innovations at scale. Their process is more sustainable, their maintenance costs are less, and they have the designers in-house who, who can now continue building out that innovative design culture. And most importantly, their product is helping them achieve their business ambition. They are now winning these larger clients. So to go back to the, the very beginning with this quote from Airbnb, well, innovating requires looking inwards as well as outwards, and as well as looking at what we are designing it's, and who we are designing for, we really need to apply that scrutiny to the how. But it's not just about designing and building the right products, but to innovate, we need that innovative design culture. And design ops is key to that culture and is how we help companies innovate and realize their product visions. And thank you very much for listening.